Light is in that, that corpus of scripture, and on his law, what does he do? He meditates, meditates day and night. Now, meditation is a funky thing in our culture, in our society, but essentially in, the, in this culture in Israel, meditating was to think about these scriptures and many times would be to speak them quietly. So to read them or recite them, because most of the time you had to have them memorized. They didn't have scrolls hanging around with them. And so this is what they would do. They would fill their minds and they would interact with their tongues this law. And what happens if we do this? Verse 3 says... He, this man who meditates, is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and, ha- and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now this is an amazing verse. Now think about you're living in an arid you know, environment, right? This is huge because drought, famine, this is a common occurrence. And this is what the promise is. And, and the reason I wanted to start here, guys, is... I want to talk a little bit about this scripture in general, because I think sometimes we think, and I know this is actually what I was kind of taught, was that the Bible, the scripture, Old Testament and New, was just kind of fell from heaven, in a sense, just came directly from God, just kind of fell here, and, and we get to read it. Isn't that awesome? But it didn't. It's not how it came about at all. The scriptures are an amazing, uh, just the scriptures themselves, amazing example of what would be hoove us all to realize, which is that God works with humans right where they are, including you, okay? And this is how we got this wonderful thing we call the Bible. Now, the Bible is, to be sure, divinely inspired. It says it's spiritual truths embedded in spiritual words, right? But how did we get this, and what is this Bible? The Bible is really, if you think about it, it's a narrative, it's a story, it's an amazing epic is what it is. And we're going to go through that epic today, by the way. And, but it's an epic of a people, human beings, actual human beings who had to ferret out things in life. They had to get up. They had to work. They had marriages, kids, etc. diseases. They had pestilence. They had famine. They had a, a, oppression. They had all sorts of things happen in their life. But this group of people that this Bible is about is all about people who want to trust in God and are endeavoring to do that. And yes, they don't always succeed, but it is a, the story of the Bible that we get to read is this is God, so in the beginning God, right? And it's God and human beings in that interaction. And it tells the whole panoply of human history. And it got to us because it was a book written within history over a thousand plus years, within human history. So it's a Think of it as a great example of God's intimate working with human beings right where they are, but still able to produce this artistic, amazing literature embedded with spiritual truths. And that's our lives, if we let him. Doing mundane things, doing the same things that anybody else would be doing, but in it, God will produce the artistic production of your life. And we have the scriptures because he did that repeatedly. And now I'm going to go to Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis chapter 1, we're going to pick it up in 20, but you know the beginning. It literally says in the beginning, right? God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, and it just, I want you to just think about it real briefly. So what, what did God do? He looked around and he said he saw that there was chaos. And the way chaos is actually, the metaphor for chaos in the Bible, and this is true actually a lot of ancient peoples, not just the Hebrews, right, was a, a chaotic sea, a dark, brooding, chaotic sea. That was a metaphor common at this era for describing chaos and darkness, right? Which is why, by the way, when you get to Revelation and it says in the new heaven and earth there's no more sea, it's not like he's going to get rid of oceans, man. So if you're a surfer, don't despair. What he's talking about, there's no more of that chaos that's, that metaphorically is, is represented by a sea, right? So... God, you know, he starts the whole process. He's creating order out of chaos, a really fundamental thing for us to pick up out of Genesis. This is how God rolls, order out of chaos. He does not want chaos, anarchy. He wants orderliness. And we get to verse 20, and he says, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the heavens, 
So God created the great sea creatures, every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind, and, saw, and God saw that it was what? Good. Next verse. And God blessed them. Big word. Blessed them. So the theme for today is blessing and cursing. Now, blessing is this great word, you know, because we use this word liberally. Like, oh, I'm so blessed, man. It was a real blessing to see you. God blessed me like this, you know. And, oh, bless your heart. You know, thanks for trying out. That's nice. Bless your heart. Um, (laughs) But, you know, the Bible actually has a little bit more of a definition wrapped around this, and we're going to learn it because it's in Genesis, and this is what God is going to define as, you want to know what blessing is? I'll tell you what blessing is. And God blessed them and said what? Be fruitful and what? Multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. Now this sounds like, well, what's the, you know, okay, that's great. God says reproduce. I mean, think about this. Who was the one who created life out of nothing? God. So he creates all of them. He just produces all of these things, all of these creatures. And then he gives, in this verse, the blessing of God includes, I'm going to give you the power to actually reproduce, to produce life that doesn't exist today. And he gave it to fish and to birds, you know, and by extension, animals too. So his created things, the way he says, here's how you know you're being blessed, you can actually be fruitful and reproduce that in others that don't even exist without you. Pretty cool, huh? Next. Verse 23, and there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. So, end of day, right? This day ended. Then we go to the next verse. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds. Are you picking up on this according to the kinds thing? If you happen to have been a science background guy like me, you will know that this is directly refuting one of the most popular, mysteriously so, to be honest with you, theories ever given in the world of science, which is that everything came from one single cell, and there is no such thing as only after its kind. God is making a point. Nope, there's actually, this is a design that I built into biological life. Everything has its kind, Okay little science lecture. And everything that creeps in the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Next verse. And then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds, over the heavens, anything on the earth, etc. Everything that creeps. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then what does he do? He blesses them. And what's the blessing? Be fruitful and reproduce yourselves. This is, the, this is part of the blessing of life, to be fruitful and then reproduce yourselves. I, I think we so minimize that in our culture. In fact, we have the unfortunate aspect of our culture that tries to actually eliminate that reproductive capacity right where it starts, right? It's like we're really proud of that 55 million people that we've taken out. But this is, you know, this is really God's intention for the human race is fruitfulness and multiplication. This, this, this is how let's roll, you know. But he also then gives human beings this dominion, this rulership, which is super important. He is like, you're, part of the reason you're going to bear my image is because I'm, I want you to rule. And I want you to take my image of goodness, fruitfulness, abundance, blessing into all the earth. Okay, keep going. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Not a lot of work here, right? Here, here's your food. Plants, seeds, nuts, whatever. And to every beast of the earth, and every bird of the heavens, and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So now we have the sixth day. That's over. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. 
And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day. He blessed the seventh day. Well, wait a minute. I thought blessing was fruitfulness and reproduction, multiplication. It is. Is there an evening and a morning after the seventh day? No. It was to be reproduced over and over and over and over. And it was to define human existence with God and with his creation. An endless Sabbath. An endless time where his blessing of this day was, I, it's going to just roll. This is the way we're going to roll together. It didn't mean you're going to be inactive or you're, there's nothing to do. He gave them jobs to do. There was a mission, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, subdue it. There's going to be things to do, but in the context of relationship with us and God and creation, Sabbath, endless Sabbath. Isn't that something? So, blessing, let's just, you know, kind of use this, this biblical term that blessing is a life-giving goodness, it's abundance, it's fruitfulness, it's reproducing goodness. This is what God had in mind. And <laughs> we also find out that in the, in, the, in the Garden of Eden, there's something called the Tree of Life. And what was the Tree of Life about? Well, if you eat the fruit of the Tree of Life, guess what? You never... You never die. You live. There's no, there's no lack of life. It's a, it's, an, it's a source of life that gives you something that will never end, an unending life. This was the tree of life. What a great thing to have in the Garden of Eden with a bunch of people who are blessed and are going to reproduce rest and peace and abundance. And, and guess what? It's going to go on and annually because we've got the tree of life. But there was another tree as well. Now, you guys... Again, this book didn't fall from heaven. This book was written by people. And this is how, in the Hebrew mind, I'm going to try to articulate and get across to generations to come profound truths regarding the reality of life with God and human beings. I'm going to use trees. By the way, the third most referred to object after God and humans in the Bible is what? Trees. Trees are... We'll do a whole teaching on one sometime. But it's incredible. He, I mean, trees are like super important to God, right? And so he used, we, we have these metaphors, a tree of life and a tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. And God's, the way this is wrapped into this narrative, this story is, do not eat the fruit of that tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because when you do that, if you, if you do that, this whole thing implodes, man. Now, what is this tree symbolic of? What is this tree of knowledge of good and evil? First of all, do you think Adam and Eve needed a knowledge of good and evil in order to rule the earth for God? I think so. I would think they would have to know, well, what is good and what is evil? So it's not about, like, well, I don't want them to know evil. Like, you know, no, no, no. See no evil, hear no evil, speak. No, this is serious stuff. This is God saying, listen, you know, what's going to happen if you go after the fruit of that tree is you're going to decide you're going to decide to define for yourselves what is good and what is not good and the moment you you disconnect me from those decisions about what's good and what's not good it's over it's it's going to be pure calamity i'm trust me on this you're not going to like the outcome and so what do they do did they choose to just eat the fruit of the tree of life and the fruits that God, and the seeds and all the stuff for food? No, we know, we know the history. We're living it. They, they ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? Now what happened after that? Chaos and pure calamity. Very quickly. Very, very quickly. I mean, within a few verses, I mean, you've got some serious stuff going on. What happens? So there's where the curse comes in. What does God curse? The first thing he curses is what? The ground. Now, he never curses Adam and Eve, by the way. You're not going to find that. But he curses the ground, and he says, what? the curse is ground for your sake. You had rulership over all this stuff. Because you've decided to walk in your own way, the ground is cursed. And instead of it just producing your food, you're going to have to work in the sweat of your back. And it's not going to produce anywhere near what you need and what you want. It's going to take 
a lot of labor. You know, <coughs> and then he curses the snake, which is a good thing, you know, which is symbolic of evil. And he says, you know, your day's coming. There's a promised seed that's going to crush your head. And I'm going to get this whole thing back on track. <coughs> but in the meantime, he says, the ground is cursed. And then he says to women, he says, you're going to have pain. It, most translations, it says in childbirth. And a lot of women who've had kids would say, yeah, for sure. <coughs> it's not childbirth, though. In Hebrew, it's the word conception is what it is. It's, a, it's to conceive, but that itself, again, this is meditation literature, folks. The reason we have to meditate on it, you've got to peel the onion back here. Is he really just talking about the pain of conceiving a child? No, he's talking about the relationships embedded in human race that produces children, men and women relationships. There is now going to be, instead of this wonderful helpmate, Adam and Eve, wonderful kind of garden existence, there's going to be strife between men and women unlike anything you can imagine. It's going to be painful. And is the Bible filled with stories of hardship and pain and anguish regarding men and women? Yes. Is there any of that today that we see? <coughs> this is a direct outcome of human beings choosing to go their own way. And this is what God set in, in, the, in Genesis here. And so this is a pattern, right, uh, that God sets. And if you go to for, Proverbs 14, 12, there's a verse. Did I give you that one, Carolyn? All right, I'm going to read it to you. It says, there is a way that seems right to a person, but, the, but the, its end is the way that leads to death. There is a way that seems right to a person, but the end of that way leads to death. This is right in Proverbs, okay? So this is just summing up exactly what has happened that God warned us about. And so cut off from God's spirit, humans are left to navigate this wor world of chaos. Decreation, because if creation is bringing order out of chaos, when you go from order to chaos, what are you doing? You're decreating is really what's happening. It's a massive degeneration of what God wanted. Um, and we're, we just see this over and over and over and over in the Bible. So after, you know, Cain and Abel come along, Cain kills his brother. This is the first, like, great depiction of here's, here's life in the new land, folks. Thanks for eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Brothers killing brothers. You know, and that, that actually continues in the Bible as well. There's all sorts of brother conflicts that define the stories of the Bible. But it's just... You can see the degradation of, of human beings, and it goes from Cain and Abel until you get, you know, Cain feels like, oh, man, you know, God, you've got you to help me because, I mean, I'm cursed because I killed my brother, which I, admittedly that was not a cool thing, but everywhere I go, people are going to try to kill me. It's like, don't worry about it. I got that covered. All right, nobody's going to be touching you, but you're, you're toast. And then a few generations, you get to Lamech, who says, Cain only killed one guy. I've killed thousands. I love killing people. This is Lamech, right? You get to the point where God, it's so messed up within a few generations, God says, every thought and intent of the human being's heart is only evil continually. And so what does he do? It says he strikes the land with a flood, he saves this guy Noah and his family, right? Sounds good, right? Big reset. Rainbow in the sky afterwards, I'm never going to flood the earth with water again. That's not going to happen. Um, but we're starting again with Noah and, and your family. And this is going to be wonderful, right? Except for, what does Noah do? He plants a tree. Uh, in this case, it's a vine, a grapevine. And it's really fruitful because there's a blessing of God on Noah's family. If you go read the language, we're not going to read everything here, but it's the same language of Eden. Fruitful, multiply. It's, it's a blessing on Noah. So with that blessing, he grows a vineyard, which is great. I like wine. He drinks a little too much wine, he ends up drunk in his tent. Now, that in itself is not the end of the story. What happens is one of his sons, Ham, comes in. We don't know exactly what happened. There's lots of, you can debate it from the Hebrew language, what really happened here. But what we know is the product of whatever happened in that tent is this kid that came from Ham and Noah's wife named Canaan. And that kid's cursed. And so, I mean, we're talking... Two generations here. Noah, his kid, his grandkid is cursed. 
right back to where we started. And guess who Canaan spawns? Canaan spawns an entire people, a whole race of people, one of which becomes Nimrod, and he decides, let's build a tower. We're going to build a tower, and we're going to make a name for ourselves. Does this sound a little arrogant? Like we know the difference between good and evil. We're the ones who are going to declare what's going on here. We are gods. We're going to build this tower. So what does God do? He confounds their languages, and they spread all over the place. Fast forward to, you know, this guy Abraham, who's called. And what happens with Abraham? Abraham, the, the, tremendous story. But out of Abraham comes the promised seed. God blesses Abraham. Does he become fruitful? Yes. Does he multiply? Yes. And he multiplies. Here's a guy who couldn't have kids. His wife couldn't have kids. It, they were like dead, totally. He's 100 years old. She's 90. You're not having kids, but you know what? God gave them a child, and that child was Isaac, and Isaac is the seed that, from which the lineage of Christ comes. So the promised seed is on its way through this guy Abraham. So everything's hunky-dory now, right? I mean, we're all good. This is, we're back on track. Well, you know, if you read the story of Abraham, it's a little bit of a checkered life. He makes a few mistakes along the way, one of which is having a son to his, to his wife's handmaid. That doesn't turn out so well. We're still dealing with that today. So, again, humans always deciding, that, I, you know, I think I'm gonna, this is probably the best thing I should do. You know, I think this is what, yeah, I, in my eyes, this is the right thing to do. Uh, no, big mistake. You chose death over life because you didn't ask God. You didn't wait on the Lord. You didn't meditate on his way. You just kind of went your own. Um, and maybe I'm the only one in the room who's done that before, but I, do, I still do that. I, I mean, I, it's just like it's crazy, this, our tendency to just go our own way. And it never works that well. Um, so anyway, let's fast forward. We're taking a, uh, the walk through the epic here. So after Abraham, he has Isaac, and then he has this guy, Jacob. Now, Jacob's an interesting dude. Jacob was the second born. Who was the first born? Come on, Bible hands. Esau, right? So does Esau get the blessing that the firstborn is supposed to get from his father, Isaac? No. Jacob gets it. The name Jacob is actually supplanter. He's like a, he's, he's a wily little guy. He's a deceiver, man. He's like, I, I'm going to get my way. <coughs> and he had a little help with, from his mom and stuff, but he gets the blessing, and the story goes on, and you know, he's kind of stolen this thing from Esau, and Esau's a, a mighty hunter, right? And so now he's a little bit concerned about Esau, and so is his mom, like I think Esau. In fact, Esau plotted to kill him. Does this remind you of Cain and Abel at all? So Esau's plotting to kill his brother now because he stole the blessing of God. And so what's God got? Well, God gave him the blessing. So what's he going to do? He's going to take care of him. He is. He, he's going to have to because he has blessed Jacob. He's like, okay, it's time to be fruitful, multiply, etc. So let's go to Genesis 28, pick up the story there. Genesis 28, verse 10. Nothing? Oh, well, that's fine. I'm sure that's my bad, Carol. Don't worry. Carol, that's fine. All right. So Jacob left Beersheba, and he went to Haran. Now, if you remember, Haran is where Abraham came from before he took his 500-mile journey into nowhere and became Abraham and all this stuff. So he's going back to his dad's family, basically, because Isaac said, you need to go back to you know, our father's family and find yourself a wife. And you got to get out of here because Esau wants to kill you anyway, so you should go. And so he does that. And he came to a certain place, and he stayed there that night because the sun had set. I love how the Bible gives you these, like, sometimes they give you hardly any details, and you're left to wonder, I don't know what is going on here. Sometimes they're like, well, Dad, yeah, the sun set. He needed a place to stay. I get it. Okay. So taking one of the stones of the place, he didn't have a pillow, so he took a stone, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder, which is really more literally, it's a, a set of stairs, stairway to heaven, okay? So, you know, the song, biggest selling rock song ever, like, okay, well, there's a reason for it. So there was a stairway set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father. 
the God of Isaac. I mean, now this is quite a moment in Jacob's life, right? Wow, he has seen something that how many human beings have actually seen, where God pulls back the curtain of heaven and earth, and he shows Jacob that heaven's not some distant place way out there past the cosmos. It's right here, and there's a stairway between the two, and there are angels descending and ascending on this thing. That's how I roll with human beings. And I'm showing you this because I'm, I blessed you, okay? And you have something to do. So, I mean, what an amazing vision, right? And he says, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. And, it shall, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north, south, and in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be what? Blessed, fruitful, multiplication. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for it, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And too often we live this out. Because you know what? The Lord is in our place and too often we do not know it right? But he is always here. And this is an amazing statement on the part of Jacob. I mean, it's like, wow, God is here, and I didn't know it, but man, now I do. So, you know, the rest of the story, Jacob goes to Haran, he finds Rachel, really likes Rachel, but then her dad tricks Jacob to trick her and deceives him into sticking around. And, you know, three wives later or whatever, it's, you know, and lots of years working for this guy, he finally leaves, and he's on his way back. Now, think about this promise that God had said to him. Don't worry about anything, man. I've got you covered. I will never leave you until you have done what I have purposed you, which is basically until the end of your days. I, I'm with you, man. But this guy, Jacob, I think the reason he gets so much press in Genesis, and he does, is because he's so representative of, of, of human beings, of us still wanting to reach to do it our way. Still looking like, you know, that's a beautiful tree to be desired and to make one wise. I think I'm going to eat the fruit of that tree because it's right there. It's beautiful. Got to be right. And, and Jacob is the same way. Jacob's had this blessing, and you would think after everything, he's like, God's got this, right? He's got me. He's on his way back to his former land, and you know what he's doing? He's freaking out. He is so afraid because he knows Esau was plotting to kill him, and Esau is a powerful guy now. He's amassed a whole army and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, oh, this is, gonna, this is not going to end well. He is, I'm toast. I'm completely toast. He starts splitting up his company. You guys go here. You guys go there. So he literally says, so if he does descend on us, he can only kill half of us, right? The other half can somehow survive. Sends his wives across the river, and then he's alone at night. And guess who shows up? God. And guess what he, what he does with Jacob? He wrestles with him. And if you look at it in the, in the Hebrew language, it's kind of funny, because it's like, it's like, God's like saying to him, dude, I mean, you're good. You are really good. I mean, you have been slick with everybody, and you've gotten your way, and you've deceived people, and you've done, you are, you are really good. And you've even, I mean, like, I got to wrestle with you now. I got to really take you down. And they wrestle. I mean, it's like there's this wrestling match going on. It goes on for a while until finally it's like, I got, it's time to end it. And he punches Jacob. There, he gets punched. Now, in the Bible, I think they've kind of sanitized this probably because some, somebody just like, well, I can't tell him the literal thing. He doesn't get punched in his, just his thigh, guys. He gets punched hard right in his groin. So hard, it dislocates his hip. What is going on here, right? <laughs> this is crazy. You've got to love the Bible. What am I to, I mean, this is a story, but this, what am I supposed to get out of this? What I'm supposed to get out of is Jacob finally, finally hangs it up and stops resisting God. And so he gets a name change. What's, he get, what's his new name? Israel. An entire nation will now come with that name. This is a guy who's like, I've, he just spawned an entire name of a nation that's going to be with us for the rest of the Bible, right? You know what Israel means? Wrestles with God. It's just it's so perfect. 
you're my, you know, you're still my guy, Jacob, and out of you is going to come 12 sons, and out of them, you know, there's a whole thing that's going to happen, a whole nation, and in that nation is the promised seed lineage happening here. But I'm, the name of this nation, and these are my people, I have selected them out, I have chosen this, this people. You know what I'm going to call you? Israel, because you're going to just keep wrestling. And that's what goes on. It, it never stops. <laughs> and we see that the, the blessing of God um, follows Israel. There's a little bit of hiccups along the way, like 400 years of slavery. That was not cool. But they get, I mean, think about this now. You, you, this is Israel. So, and these are the five books of the Torah. Okay, everything I'm talking about is still in Genesis, right, for the most part, and then Exodus. So the whole book of Genesis ends with Jacob and his 12 sons and the great guy Joseph in Egypt and the blessing and abundance and fruitfulness that God brings to pass on the family of Jacob all the way to Jacob's end of days. And then we, you know, fast forward and we've got slavery and then we have Moses. But Moses leads them out and they get into the desert and they get the tabernacle, right? The tabernacle is kind of that, this is what God wanted. I want to dwell with my people so I can continue to work with them and show them how they can be abundant and fruitful and multiply. And so build me a tabernacle, and you know what I'm going to do, God says? I'm actually going to show up. I am going to make a place where heaven and earth connect in the holy of holies of the tabernacle. And you know how you're going to know that I've shown up? There's going to be a glory in that place that's going to shine. And so he does. He shows up. And so now here's a people who've come through all of this history, and they know everything we're talking about today. This is embedded in their minds, right, because they meditate, they think about this. These are stories that define them as a, as a race of people, and now they're in this desert, and they've got a place, a tabernacle that God dwells in, and they are this special, wonderful people. And the promises that he gives them are off-the-chart blessings. And what do they do? They toss it. <laughs> they reject it. And so then God has to wait 40 years, what should have taken a couple of weeks journey. 40 years. Why? Because the whole generation has to go off, has to just disappear. Because he can't go into the promised land, which is where he's taken them with that generation, because they just decided to go for the wrong tree again. And I can't, I can't, I can't do that. So I've got to wait for another generation now. And so we get to the, the book of Deuteron Deuteronomy, by the way, which is the fifth book of the Torah. That whole book is one day. One day. It's just one day in Moses' life with all these people of Israel who are about to cross the Jordan. And you get to, so it's, it's a tremendous book. It's really cool to read it and, and to see how it's structured. But you get to the end, and, and this, is, this is now Moses' kind of last pep talk, <laughs> if you want to call it that. We, we'll find out it's really not a great pep talk, but he is basically just giving a prophetic vision to these, this generation of, of those who wrestle with God, who are going to cross over from the eastern side of the Jordan to the western side and go into a promised land. So Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. And when all these things come upon you, this is mid, kind of mid-sentence, guys, or mid-speech, mid the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God, will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples of the Lord your God, at, you know, where the Lord your God has scattered you. He's going to gather you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of, the, of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous, fruitful and multiply than your fathers. This is a blessing upon a blessing, okay? And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. This is not just going to be a minor fleshy circumcision thing. 
a cutting off of skin. I am going to actually transform your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may what? Live. Choose life. This is what I am promising I will do for you. Keep going. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted, and you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous <laughs> in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, in the fruit of your cattle, in the fruit of, your ground, of the ground. The Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers. Are you getting a picture here of how God likes to roll with us? This is the God in whom we live and move and have our being. This is the God that we come here today to worship and to learn more about. This is the God that rolls with you in your life, right where you are every day. And by the way, he's wrestled with the best. He's not afraid of you, okay? He can take all your wrestling and he can turn it into blessing. But at some point, you've got to stop. You've got to just give it up. And I would recommend you stop before he punches you. <clears throat> when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are within this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, well, who's going to ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea or it's in the deep that you should say, well, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and to do it? But the, Lord, but the word is very near you. Where is it? It's in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God and I, that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. The Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. Does this sound familiar? It goes back to pre-fall Eden. Don't do it, because the day you do it, you perish. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess I call to heaven and earth, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. That you and your be fruitful, multiply, your offspring may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him that for he is your life, your length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. I mean, what a speech, right? But if you keep reading, you know what Moses <laughs> says toward the end of his great speech? He says, and you're not going to do it. Because <laughs> I know you. You're all stiff-necked. You're all going to resist the Lord. And it's, here's what's going to happen to you. And then he paints this picture of absolute exile. And he says, that's, yep. So it's not like your uh, halftime coach, you know, speech in the locker room, let's go out there and win one for the Gipper. This is, it would have been so good, man, but you're not going to do it. What is going on here? Why is this? Isn't this just weird, right? I mean, God has done all these things, starting with Adam and Eve, all the way through Israel, and every time he does this thing, and he blesses, and he promises, and he says, man, and he proves it. I mean, it's like pillar fire, pillar, you know, smoke, cloud. I'm in the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle, in the temple. Every time he shows up, and he just does these magnificent wonders and things, and yet it's just this cycle over and over and over again of choosing death over life. And what is going on? Well, in Romans 7, 
And you don't have this verse either, Carolyn, that's fine. But I just, I'm going to cite Romans 7. You can read it sometime. If you go to Romans 7, written by the Apostle Paul, what does he say that is going on here? He says, listen, this thing, the law, the Torah, I love it. I love it. And I am absolutely scrupulous to obey it. And he was. He was a zealot. The whole life of Paul is a fascinating life. This guy was just a giant, intellectually, every, in every way. He said, man, is touching the righteousness of this, of this law. I'm blameless, man. I, you give me the Torah, you give me the things that I'm supposed to do or not supposed to do, I'm going to do those to the letter until I got to that one law of thou shalt not covet. And it killed me. Now, why? Because all the other things are externally visible. You can tell that I'm not killing anybody, right? Or worshiping an idol. But can you tell when I'm coveting? No. It's the hidden man of the heart, right? It's an inside thing. It's my nature to covet the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's my nature that's the problem. That's the problem. This is why all of the promises and blessings of God that had been given to Israel had just been met with this cycle of disobedience, exile, salvation, disobedience, exile, salvation, over and over again, because it was just embedded in the nature of human beings. And Paul recognizes that. I, I, I got to that, and it, it killed me. And then he goes on in Romans 7, he says, who's going to deliver me from this dead body of mine. Who, how am I going to get out of this? And he says, oh, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, that I'm delivered. And, and in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says in this letter to the Corinthians, same guy says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? Do not fail to understand what this is saying. This is the quintessential difference between the, the covenant in the, mediated by the, the blood and body of Jesus Christ, mediated by the, the works of Jesus Christ, and the covenant that God had in the Old Testament, which were wonderful. And Paul's quick to say, hey, the law was good and just. God's covenants, he doesn't change, man. He wanted fruitfulness, multiplication, blessing, Always. It's always what I've wanted with you. I've wanted to dwell with you. I've wanted to be with you. It's what I had intended. An endless Sabbath with people in a Garden of Eden situation with things to do together. I've always wanted that. But you've just never done it. And so here's what I'm going to do with the Messiah. And you didn't see this coming, did you, devil? <coughs> I'm going to give a whole new creation to these people. It's not going to be the same. This is going to be a different people. Not the people of the lineage of the flesh of Abraham, but people of the faith of Abraham. And by that, by their belief, they can appropriate my son Jesus Christ accomplished work and I will create in them something that has never been, been there before, a new nature. And we have this. Now, if you think you're going to feel it, on the level of your senses, you're not necessarily going to feel it that way. We can manifest it. One of the reasons speaking in tongues is so, I mean, it's, it's fantastic, but it's so present in the book of Acts. Is it's so imperative for those, for those first 12, they needed to grasp quickly, oh, wow, something's, something is completely different here. There's a whole new thing happening. And it's the Spirit of Christ sent into our hearts whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It is a new nature. It's the spirit that, yes, was given on Pentecost, but it's given to everybody now who is born again, born from above. <clears throat> and all of it is due to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, who is ushered in a whole new covenant, but it's not, it's like, it's not disconnected from what, what, what uh, Moses was saying to the people in Deuteronomy 30. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart desire and prayer to God for them 
is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness, that talking about Israel, that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, I did it my way, Frank Sinatra, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, and these are words right out of Deuteronomy 30, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. And that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved, saved, rescued from exile of death, brought back into a, a relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth, your father that is inviolate, that you cannot lose, it is, it is a, an access now through the Spirit of Christ that you get that is unlike anything that you could have gotten in the Old Testament. I mean, we are so privileged, guys. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 18. For through him, Jesus Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints members of the household of God, built on the foundation of apostles, prophets, and Jesus Christ himself being the, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a what? A dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Can, you, can we possibly grasp what it is that we sitting in this room part of the body of Christ are from God's perspective, what he has done. Because he's always had clarity about what he's doing. He's always had clarity about the blessing and the life that he is offering to human beings. He is super clear and excited about the fact, I can, I can invite you now into this body of Christ where each of you as a member of this body has the spirit of Christ in you, which gives you a new nature. It's a new creation in you that has access once again to the tree of life that sits in the middle of this thing, which is Jesus Christ. And you are being built together into a what? A holy temple of the Lord where the, the glory of God dwells in such a way it so exceeds the glory of God dwelling in the tabernacle and the temple of the Old Testament. This is who we are, folks. This is who we are. And it's going to manifest itself in the hidden man of the heart. This is where the domain is. It's not a physical land anymore right? The promised land is my heart, and the transformation of that, so it's conformed more and more to the image of his son, and if I will do that, and you will do that, and we come together into this new temple of the Lord, how much more bright does the glory of God shine for the nations of the world to see, once again, this people have a God that is blessing them. They are fruitful. They are abundant. They multiply, right? That's our calling, Romans chapter 12. Here's what we need to do. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't continue to do what people have done all <laughs> over and over again and eat of the wrong fruit but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You have the mind of Christ, for heaven's sakes. We have the Spirit of Christ in us. We have access to this. If we would just let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, transformation is going to happen. And then we're going to see what is the, good, the, the will of God that's good, acceptable, and perfect. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. Oh, did you just have it, verse 6? It's all right. It is a good verse. Bear with me.
with me, folks. Here we go. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh in the flesh, in order that the righteousness require, righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk what? Not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's the, that's the Eden vision. That's the tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Which one are you going to walk according to? Which one would you like? Right? Choose life. Walk according to the Spirit of Christ in you. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on flesh is death, but to set the mind on Spirit is what? Life and peace. It's Sabbath time again, folks. <clears throat> and Romans 8, 18, I'm going to go to that. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation, the whole creation, remember the cursed ground? Remember the creation that we were supposed to be ruling, but we decided not to? That whole creation is longing for revealing the sons of God. It's waiting to be free from its being subject to futility because they've been subjected to it, right? Because we fell. Um, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This is your destiny. When heaven and earth are once again back together and we are taking our place in Eden again on earth, this is where we're just supposed to be, right? That the whole creation, <laughs> look at this. I mean, it's unbelievable that they are going to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. That's us. This is where we're going. This is the calling that we're supposed to have. So can we walk worthy of that calling today? Yes, we can, if we choose, if we choose life. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. And this is going to be a great day when our bodies are redeemed, right? For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, but you know, for who hopes for what they see. But we with hope, but, we, but if with hope, for what we, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience, with patience. And while we're being patient for that day, what are we to do? We are to grow up into him in all things. We are to continue to grow our lives up so that we become better and better members of this body of Christ, so that we, act, we ourselves are transformed into the image of his son, so that we more and more pick the right fruit and make the right decision to choose life, to break this cycle, this human cycle, this unfortunate human cycle of disobedience, exile, salvation, disobedience, exile, salvation, where our lives are just cycling through this. We can do that. I'm sure some of us have experienced it. But isn't it just time to rest from that? Isn't it just time to stop wrestling and just say, okay, you are, you are the Lord of my life, Jesus, and you're the one who has given me access to God the Father, and I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to do. I may not be perfect at it, but I'm, I'm going to be faithful at that. That's what I'm going to do. And as we, you know, what we're waiting for is this fantastic hope, which is in Revelation 22. That you have. Then the angel showed me, and we need to open our eyes so we can try to see this too, guys. The river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Through the, whoop, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, hey, a tree, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The, trees of the, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. No more curse. No more curse, only blessing. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. That's our destiny, folks. That's where we're going. And in the meantime, we get to be people who eat the right fruit, make the right decision. Because it's been set before us. Life and death has been set before us, clearly. 
So let's choose life, okay? Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your calling. We thank you that you are a God who has sought a people to allow you to dwell. God, continue to work in us mightily through Christ that we are more and more transformed into those people in whom your spirit dwells and is a light to the world. We thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.